Like this is uh, for all of you who don't know who we have on the show. This is my guy, and and I feel special. Like I'm saying, he's a special guest, but he truly is because one, he's a friend. I know him personally. This should be a great conversation. And I want to say that his name exudes exactly who the fuck he is. Excuse my language, but it, it tells you exactly who he is. His name is Cam F. Awesome. Uh, welcome to the show, Cam. I appreciate you, dog. Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Here. Yeah. And, and let me just tell you guys, if you don't know who he is, please look him up. One, if you go back in the boxing world, if you're a big boxing fan, Cam is the winningest amateur boxer in U.S. history. He is the guy there. And if you are in the speaking realm, he is a national uh, national known speaker, uh, travels all around the world talking uh, to children and uh, in corporate world. Like, he does his thing. So, again, man, I'm excited to have you on the show. Thank you, bro. Yeah, and what I'm most uh, excited about is that winningest is an actual word. Uh, not a lot of people know that. I had no idea until we actually confirmed it earlier because every time I ask myself, like, I say it out loud, I'm like, is that really a word? Did I just say winning this? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a word. It's a thing. Right, but yeah. not too many people hold that title. Is that, nah, yeah. there's not a lot of us. That's why you don't hear that word too much. <laughs> I got you, dog. Well, before I jump, like, because obviously I, I would love for you to go back and tell us about your story, but before we do that, I, and I said Cam F. Awesome, and I'm sure a lot of people think that maybe that's your stage, your stripper name, something like that, <laughs> right? But tell us, like, tell us about the name. It's your, it's your real name. Yeah, yeah, so I legally changed it because I legit thought I was awesome, uh, and it has been since confirmed. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I actually changed my name to Trick the Universe. Yeah. Uh, I've always heard you got to speak what you want into existence, and I decided I was going to believe in myself, and I thought I was awesome. I wanted to be awesome. And if I change my name to awesome, I got to commit to it. Man, that's dope, dog. I've, I've never heard that before. That, that's amazing. And it's less than $200 to change your name. Well, well, kids, uh, if you're listening out there, oh, you, you can be, be 18, <laughs> you can be whatever you want. <laughs> you, whatever you want, you can name yourself whatever you want. That's dope, man. Well, hey, Cam, do me a favor, man, and, and tell us a little bit about your backstory, right, about, about the boxing, about your, your brain, your upbringing and things like that. Uh, so I, uh, it's funny enough, we're in the gym because I, I struggled with, well, I still struggle with weight. Uh, so I always had a... a, a issues with weight and I was like 14, 15, I was super insecure about my weight and I wanted to lose weight. And I figured out in class, they explain how calories work. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you consume about 2000 calories a day and you, you burn about 2000 calories a day and you break even, right. uh, which meant if you want to lose weight, you got to burn more calories than you consume. Facts. So I was like, cool. I went to join a team. I couldn't make any teams. I tried out for all the teams that didn't work. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna go rollerblading every morning before school. That's, that's different. Uh, no, not a lot of people rollerblading where I'm from. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, it's, it's a it little different. It was just me. <laughs> it was just me. All right. Always, always been me. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I went morning after morning after morning. I went six days in a row. Okay. Because I was like, this is how you lose weight. And day seven, I woke up. I was sore. I was tired. I was frustrated. I didn't see no progress. Ain't nobody stopping. I was like, Cam, I can tell you losing weight. Keep up the good work. Right. And I remember thinking like, well, is there any other way to lose weight? Because I don't want to keep doing this if, if I'm wasting my time. And I looked, at, I looked at like an equation. This is mathematically the only way to lose weight. Any diet you've ever heard is just a different variation of you burning more calories than you consume. Right. And I was like, all right, I just, I got nothing else to do. I'll just keep doing it. I didn't gain all this weight in six days. I'm not going to lose in six days. And that was the first time I ever dealt with delayed gratification. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I wanted to lose weight is so I could go to the boxing gym. Now, I didn't, you didn't need to make the team to make the boxing gym, but I was insecure about my weight, so I was afraid to go to the boxing gym as a chubby kid. So I was like, maybe I can look good before I go to the box. Like, yeah. you know, you, you, you brush your teeth real well before you go to the dentist. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to show up correct. Yeah, 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 for sure. I get that all the time. Man. Yeah. Uh, and when I got in the ring to spar, like, I, my goal was just to – fitness. I just want to get in shape. I wanted to, I want to look like a boxer. I didn't mm -hmm. actually want to fight or none of that. And then I got in great shape from actually working. I started to lose the weight and started feeling good about myself. And they asked me to spar. And I was like, oh no, my mom, not going to let me. Yeah. And then everybody laughed and I was like, oh, I'm joking. I'm joking. I get in my mouthpiece. And like, I got in the ring and I was so afraid to get hit. I was just moving around a whole bunch and I didn't get hit. And I realized I, I, I burned so much calories. I was moving so much in that ring. I was like, oh, I love sparring. Yeah. And I was like, if I don't get hit, it's fun. 
So my only goal in, in boxing was not to get hit when I was in the gym. So I'm sparring big guys, little guys. I'm not even throwing many punches back. I'm just worried about not getting hit because I'm burning all the calories. Yeah. Eventually, I decide to have my first fight because I realize here's the equation. One plus two equals three. In this equation, you are one. You should always be your own number one. Always be your biggest fan. Ain't nobody going to believe in you unless you believe in yourself. Facts. Love that. Yeah. Uh, in this equation, one plus two equals three. Three is the outcome, the goal, the objective. Like, whatever you're trying to achieve, that's three. Yeah. One plus two equals three. Two in this equation is everything you have to do to get to three. Which most people don't want to do. That's why I call it number two. <laughs> it's the shitty part of the job. Oh, there you go. Nobody don't want to. That's, it's, the, it's the waking up early in the morning. It's the running. It's running in the rain. It's going to going to do stuff you don't want to do is is watching film it's airport labors all the things you don't want to do so whatever your goal is if it's if it's to lose weight me plus burning more calories than i consume equals losing weight the i figured out this equation and i realized i figured out a secret to life because i was like oh there's nothing i can't do yeah like i'm gonna need some patience but i legit when i figured out this equation one plus two equals three and i realized i could just not get hit in boxing right and if i don't get hit i win one plus two equals three. Me plus not getting hit equals being the best boxer in the world. There you go. Before my first fight, I was legit. I was sure I was the best boxer in the world. Hey, and that's I, the confidence you need. I won my first fight, and I got my butt handed to me my second fight. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what happened to this equation? <laughs> One plus two equals three. And I went back to – so my first fight I won. Second fight, I, I decided to fight this dude with 50 fights in, in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. I was, this was back when I was in New York. And I went and it's like – Little Puerto Rico, like everyone's Puerto Rican. I, I went there in his, home, his hometown to fight. And I got just my second fight. Yeah. And I was like, oh, there's going to be a bunch of mad Puerto Ricans. Nah, he beat me up. Yeah. Yeah, I lost that fight. It took you back to the drawing board, though. You went took, back to it. I won my third fight. I went back to, to the Bronx to fight him again. Lost again. Wow. Uh, and I realized, well, the equation ain't perfect. But it will give me the best shot at winning. Yeah. And if, if I look at it like I'm betting on myself and if I do that equation, it's going to give me my, my best shot at success. So I realize with that equation, with experience, experience and patience are the only things you could add to that, that to, to that equation. Mm -hmm. And I realized after I after I had those first four fights and I went two and two, I was like, oh, I'll just have to slowly work my way up, fight people who have the same experience as me, work my way up and get way better than everybody else. Because the more fights you have, the better you are. Right. I'm just going to have more fights than anybody else. There you go. I'm not even that good. Yeah. Like, my first 100 fights, I wasn't good. Like, I wasn't that good. How many fights have you had, Nia? 400. 400. Just, just under 400. Yeah. Man, that's a lot of that. Well, you, you, you say you, you, the goal was not to get hit. I was going to say, that's a, lot of, that's, that's a lot of hits to take. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't take much damage in my career. I never got knocked out. Uh, I did get stopped one fight. It was shady. I was fighting. It was Venezuela. I was throwing punches back. Yeah. I shouldn't have been stopped. Yeah. But maybe I should have been stopped. Gotcha. If they didn't stop, maybe I got, would have got knocked out. But hey. I've never been knocked out. Okay. So you went down that path. You kind of, and, and I think it's awesome how early in life you kind of figured out this equation, right? You figured out this little tool to life. And I think the same thing happened to me as far as like my development and, and becoming athletic and, and growing as a, a athlete and a person, right? I was the chubby little kid who I didn't want to play football though. I hated football. My father was just adamant about me playing. Like you're going to play this. So as a result, I played on the line. I played the, the, the positions that nobody really wanted to play when you're that young, right? I wanted to score the touchdowns. I wanted to be the glory, the, the kid. And I knew that he wasn't going to let me quit. So I had one, like, there was only one option. And that was to get better at what I actually wanted to do. And that was scoring the touchdowns so the cheerleaders can shake their pom-poms for me. And the crowd, yeah. the parents can be like, oh, that's such and such kid. Like, I wanted that glory. So I figured, like, all right, well, I'm actually, I'm going to work hard this summer. I'm going I'm to, you know, go train. I'm going to do push-ups and sit-ups in the basement and pull-ups on the bar and, you know, go in the backyard and throw the ball up and pretend I'm running, lose a little bit of weight and show the coach that, man, I can run the rock or I can throw the ball. And, and that's what happened. And I think a lot of people ask me, like, you know, how do you, how'd you get that, like, that dedication? How'd you get that, that grit type of deal? And I just happened to get really early, like lucky early in life that that worked at that age. No, no, no. I, I, I disagree with you, if I can respectfully. Yeah, no. I think, because we, we both figured out when we were younger, 
we were dumb enough to believe we could. Exactly. Right. And as we get older, we stop believing in stuff. True. Very true. Very true. And I, and again, and that's why I say I think just in, in the lucky sense that it happened to me when I was young and not older, and I didn't have this this block on my you know in my in my that brain. That, exactly. So it worked, and I was like, oh, so you mean if I just work hard at something I want, like I can achieve it? And ever since then, I just I've always had that that knack to like go get it. If I want to do something, I'm gonna do it. Right. Put your kids in sports. That's it. I don't even care what the sport is. Exactly. Don't even, they don't have to deal with other people. Even boxing, a similar sport, like a singular sport, still got to deal with people. Exactly. Exactly. I, you know, again, I, and I, that's why I love athletics. I love, you know, football just because of the, the teamwork and the camaraderie. But I've, I've done mixed martial arts. I've done boxing when I was younger. Certainly not at your level. So don't, you know what I mean? I don't want to, I, well, I, I, I couldn't make the, the football <laughs> team in middle school. So <laughs> same, same deal. But yeah, it's just that, that tenacity. And, and if I must be, I, I quit boxing twice when I was a kid, right? Just that, that, uh, that repetitive, like at the gym that I was going to, Eastside Boxing Ring down, in, down on 12th Street when I was growing up, it's like we did the same thing every day. You come in, you run them out, like you spar, you lift the weights. And I just was like, I just want to fight. Like I came here to fight. I just want to get in the box. And they were like, nah, you got to go through all of these steps for months before we're going to let you fight. So those steps, those steps are the only reason why I'm better. I was better than most of the other boxers. Yeah. Because like the steps is like going running that mile. Okay, you're going to run a mile? I'm going to go run three. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm not as athletic as you are. I'm not as strong as you are. I can't lift as much weight as you are, but I'm gonna I'm outwork you. Yeah, that's the only thing I have a. That's my only way of winning, is to be in way better shape than everybody else. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that's dope, man. Well, like, so again, you kind of figured out that equation. You started putting all these, you know, fights underneath your belt, and then you started to really see some success. And what did that look like? I know there was talk like of Olympic trials and things like that, and, and even going pro. So what what stopped you from from going there? Uh, so uh, what actually? So the one plus two equals three equation. I figured out that I, that's how I figured out the number two, and that's like you have to put in the work. I struggle with the number one, which is believing in myself, the confidence part about it. My senior year in high school, made a promise to myself I would never miss the gym. I ain't got nothing else going for me. I ain't going to college. Like. I got, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go hard in the gym. Uh, but the boxing gym was six miles away from my high school, so I just walked six miles every day after school, five days a week. It was back when this was MP3 player days. <laughs> I didn't have batteries, so I had to just walk and make up stories because yeah. keep myself entertained. And in these stories, I was kicking ass. Yeah. I was beating everybody up. I had all the money. I had all the girls. I had all the fame. None of it was true. But for three hours, I pat myself on the back, told myself how amazing I was. I had nothing else to do. Right. I wasn't thinking anything of it. And then I would go work out. And I would do that. 15 hours a week, I did that for about six months. And the pendulum had swung. I had went from this, and I would also moved from New York to Florida. And no one knew who I was. So I just pretended I was always confident. Yeah. I pretended I was the person I wanted to be in New York that I couldn't be. Awesome. I got to start over fresh. And... I, I started to believe in myself. I was cocky, bro. I was, <laughs> the pendulum has swung. Yeah. My shit didn't stink. That's Nothing I could do was wrong. Like, I knew I was the best boxer in the world. Like, probably wasn't, but I look back at tapes, I was like, oh, you weren't close. But that's the only thing I believed, and you couldn't tell me anything differently. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that belief, I, I'm, I qualified for the, two, the 2008 Olympic trials before, like, uh, I mean, I was in the, I was in two years in the box and I qualified for the Olympic trials. I lost, but I realized everybody who, everybody who lost, they either quit or turn pro. Gotcha. If everybody leaves on the best, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and with the whole experiencing, I realized with that first boxer that beat me, he had 50 fights. I had two. I was like, oh, I, I'm the one with 50 fights now. Right. It's just a new crop of young boxers coming up. Yep. I'm king of this castle. And I just blindly believed that I deserved to win all the time from that point on. And I won pretty much nationals every year until I, I, 2008, 9, 10, 11. Uh, I was on Team USA. I was captain of the Team USA. I got to travel to other countries to represent uh, America. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is an honor. Like, yeah, man, I'm, that's dope. I, I know a lot of people feel a way about the national anthem, but that song gets me hyped. Yeah. Because that's like, that's what you hear before war. Like, before fighting, I'm like, oh, like I hear that now and I'm pumped. That's awesome. And being able to like represent the U.S. was such a cool experience because I got to travel for free. 
Yeah. That was a good time. Yeah, man. I bet. I bet you got some crazy stories there going all around the world, huh? Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. So, I mean, you, you lost the first Olympic trials. You have yeah. another opportunity. How did it? Uh, so, I won the 2012 Olympic trials to represent U.S. I did that in the super heavyweight weight class. And uh, then I got kicked off the Olympic team for uh, paper for, for drug testing failure. <sighs> Come again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, didn't even fail a drug test. I, did, I left the country and didn't inform them and they showed up to my house here in Kansas City to give me a random drug test oh and that was God. in Azerbaijan fighting in a tournament you get drug tested to fight in and they wouldn't they wouldn't accept that they would it was uh it was that's not even a real offense but it was after Lance Armstrong won on Oprah ouch yeah they weren't playing no games which N- they made example out of some athletes uh I should have emailed them now I was leaving the country as stupid as it seems yeah uh that's my job my responsibility I it took me a long time to like, yeah, you know, deal with that, but mm-hmm. it was it was a tough year off because like I'm in Kansas City, it's, you know, I'm in the newspaper, I'm in like the Kansas City Star, like oh I'm going to the Olympics, and then you know I win the Olympic trials, I'm on the news, like I'm in Walmart, like hey man you going to the Olympics, I'm like yeah, and then I get kicked off the Olympic team, and then everybody's asking me hey man you ready for the Olympics? Dang, ah. That's that's gotta hurt a little bit. I know. I'm sure that was that was a hard hard year. Yeah. How'd you overcome? What was what was next after that? Uh, I, I gained a lot of weight, drank a lot, uh, and then had to get out. Had to get over myself. Like uh, I was like, I, I felt felt like it was unfair that I got kicked off the team, and I like I deserve to be there. And the guy who took my spot, I beat five to five out of five times. I beat him. Wow. No disrespect to him. Yeah. He shouldn't have been there. And, like, I was so angry at him. He ain't do nothing. Right. <laughs> it's like, dude, is it, is it, your girl just cheated on you with another man. You yeah. mad at him. Right. Like. I'm, I'm, I need to be mad at boxing. Right. Yeah. So I decided, I was like, you know what? Uh, I, I'm going to change the way I'm looking at things. Because I, I was being a victim. I was having a pity party. And I realized, don't nobody care about your feelings but you. Right. One plus two equals three. The only thing you can't add to that equation, feelings. So nobody care about your feelings. I know we live in a culture where feelings are important. Like I value mental health. That's different than your feelings. Right. And a lot of people think feelings are mental health. They different. Don't nobody care about your feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, suck it up and get back. And I could have sat around and cried. Like I deserve to be there. This other boxer five out of five. And I was like, Oh no one. Like after that news cycle came and like ESPN did the article and people left their comments a week later, they, no, nobody cared. Right. Before the Olympics even happened, people forgot I wasn't going. And I was like, I got to make some changes. I was humbled by life. I was humbled. Yeah, I was humbled by life. And then I looked back at the, different, def, like, the difference between me in 2006, walking to the boxing gym, talking highly about myself and patting myself on the back, and then me at 2012 after I was mad at myself for not going to the Olympics. One of me liked us. Mm. Uh, And I was like, all right, I'm going to get back to liking me. I looked into, I looked up the definition of humble. It's not a positive thing. You're, you're absolutely right. And a lot of people don't understand that. And that's, that's, that is big. And actually, you know, I heard you speak on it a few times. So I kind of like, it it hit me and I was like, let me really look this up and figure this out. And you're absolutely right. The whole, I mean, I've always, I was taught that like, be humble, right. And playing ball, I've always been the guy that like, don't celebrate, right. Like, do your job, go to the sideline, be humble, be humble, be humble. It's all I was ever like taught. And now I'm teaching my kids the complete opposite. Yeah. No humbleness here, bro. Right. I jump into the ring with a cape on. Yeah. And, and if you don't know what humble actually means, please look it up in the dictionary. Actually, you have it following you? Okay. My, no. Okay. Uh, so, and, and the reason why, so I looked up the definition of humble and I realized it's not the positive thing that you think it is. Uh, and it's this great American virtue. Uh, And the first definition, having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's own importance. I have no desire to do that at all. Maybe that's a fluke. Uh, Definition number two, of low social, administrative, or political rank. I won't. No, not at all. (laughs) How about the third definition? Uh, Well, we'll just leave it at two because of... Of modest pretensions or dimensions, not as good. Uh, or lower someone in dignity or importance. I'm not lower than anybody. How about yourself? 
I'm high. I'm okay. up there. So, right. but this whole idea that we have is like, you're supposed to be humble. Of course, first of all, preface this. You're supposed to be humble in the eye of the Lord. A lot of people believe that. Sure. Last time I checked, Jesse, that wasn't you. Right. Cool. So, I'm not going to be humble around you. When you have like something good that goes on in your life and like you got great news and you run into that friend who's not doing too well, you're up here and you, they're down here and you got that good news and you're like, oh, you don't want to share with them. So what do you do? You humble yourself. You humble yourself. Right. You lower yourself down. Now, if we always lower ourselves down to the lowest common denominator in the room, we're going to be one depressed ass civilization. Right. So my philosophy is different. If I'm here, I'm going to try to bring you up to where I am but I'm not going to lower you down. So when I thought about this in 2012, I was like, oh, I'm not being humble. I was humbled by life. Life is always going to humble you. I'm not going to help life. I'm not being humble. So I changed my last name to awesome because I legit think I'm awesome. <laughs> I love it, dog. I love it. Yeah, like I said, when, when I heard you speak about that when we first kind of met, it hit me and I was like, no, you're absolutely right. I've all, and I've always done that. I've always been the type that I'm going to hold my things in. I'm not going to celebrate my victories. You know, I'm quiet. I'm this and that. And I felt like, why not? Like, embrace talk talk, it. King. it. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, I am the, I am the man, right? We're going we gonna to put it out there. I am the man. And, I, I, and I, I know that I'm confident in who I am and what I do. And it's just made me a better person, I feel, like just carrying myself with such high self-esteem, which, yeah. again, when I was – the way I was raised, that wasn't the case. It was like, you know – Calm down, be quiet, just do your job, go to work. So, man, I, I appreciate that, that, that gym. And, and you don't have to think lower of anybody else Correct. because you think highly of yourself. For sure. I'm not saying be arrogant. The, the opposite of humble is an arrogance. Right. It's confidence. Yeah. It's with faith. That's what confidence means. You know what's going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, the, the funny thing, like the play on that, right, is, is a narcissist, like, most people say like, oh, he's so narcissistic, like, yeah. but it's a good thing. You thinking highly of yourself and speaking highly of yourself and being like, again, if so, if you go and you look that definition up, you'd be surprised because you want your child to yeah. think highly of themselves and, and be confident and walk in confidence. Um, so, yeah, no, man, that's dope. That's absolutely dope. I'm with you. So you found that, right? You, you, you thought to yourself, right, I'm going to change my name, Cam F. Awesome. Like, yeah. what's the next move after that, bro? Uh, I decided, like, first of all, I threw all my eggs in the boxing basket. And, like, I was traveling around the world for free, like, living life. I was living in L.A., had a, a condo in L.A., chef, mate. Life was good, bro. And yeah. I got kicked off the Olympic team. I lost everything. Mm -hmm. And I realized I never had anything. Wow. I had boxing. And boxing leased me some things. Mm. And then once I didn't have my sport anymore, I realized I was nothing. And I, I realized I didn't have a backup plan. So immediately I knew I had to box again because I didn't know how to do anything. No certifications, no degrees, no backup plan. And I was like, all right, when I go back to boxing, I'm going to no longer treat myself as an athlete. I'm going to treat myself as an artist and I'm going to behave as a manager. Mm. So I'm going to promote myself. Last na my last name's awesome. I fight in any city. The news station shows up. There's a list of names. Which one are you going to interview? Him and Fawson, Every baby. single time. <laughs> I did nothing but interviews. I'm, I'm comfortable with them now. So I have that. Uh, I, I started doing stand-up comedy in, 20, in 2012 because I realized I was going to use boxing to build a platform for myself for after sports. That's what I want athletes to do. Athletes need to know that your relevancy of an athlete, you think you're the man, right? You think you're the girl, like the woman. You, you, that, you that person. As soon as the sweat on your jersey dries after your last game, don't nobody remember you played. Exactly. It's limited. Limited. Somebody going to wear that number next season. Right. And us, we as athletes, we think we're important, but we're not. The sport's important. But we have to utilize that while we still have it. So while you're an athlete, use that to make any deals you have. These, and I, this NIL thing is around. Game changer. Bro, oh if my this God. was back in my day, <laughs> and yo, I haven't been to college yet. I might enroll. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna look into that. Hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, join still, a bowling league. Yeah, you still let you were an amateur. You never went pro. You no. probably yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go yeah. in the cars. Uh, but like monetize. This is a business. So the way I looked at this is like, okay, I'm gonna start doing stand up comedy. But to get good at comedy, I needed to be on the stage. One plus two equals three. Me one two stage time equals three better performer. One plus two equals three. As a boxer, whoever has the more fights I have, the better I am. Right. Right. Well, as 
a performer, the more time on stage, the better I am, correct? Yeah. So I need to be on stage as much as possible. Started doing stand-up comedy. I'm not that funny. I just started. But ticket promoters, they don't care about how funny you are. They care about how many tickets you can sell. Mm. So I have a lot of people who are very supportive around here in Kansas City, and they showed up to my terrible-ass comedy shows. (laughs) And I knew they weren't good, but I realized, like, I'm, you just got to suck at something enough and you'll eventually get good. And people are so afraid to suck at something. Right. Like, be bad. Like, here's why. Because we judge people who are bad at things. And if you judge other people who are bad at things, you are afraid to be bad at things yourself. No question. No question. But I mean, that's, that's a tough ask, though, for somebody to get up on stage and, and talk they talk and, and know that they're not good at it right now. Right. That's. I, I, that's huge ass. You, you, can do that in, you can do that on a comedy stage. There's a lot of people who won't come to the gym because they're not comfortable in the gym. Right. Be uncomfortable long enough, you're going to get comfortable. Absolutely. You don't know how to lift weights? Okay. You'll eventually figure it out. Like, whatever the thing is that's your barrier, one plus two equals three. Your feelings don't matter. Yeah. You're scared? That's a feeling. Feelings don't, being scared ain't mental health. Right. I value mental health. I don't care about your feelings. Love it. Love it. Okay. Awesome. So you, you back to the formula, one plus two equals three, yeah. right? So the new attitude. So uh, I was going to be a performer through boxing. So I was going to use my platform of boxing, pr- promote myself and transition into uh, be a, being a performer. So I was thinking stand up comedy. So I'm doing open mics. I'm traveling around as, as I'm tr- f- traveling around fighting. If I have a fight in Dallas, I reach out to the comedy club like, Hey, I don't want no money, but I can sell tickets. I'm fighting this weekend. Let me do some shows and I'll do some weekend shows there. I wasn't getting paid, but I was getting stage time. I was getting better. I was working on my jokes. Still terrible, but I'm like two years in. Uh, Then I started emceeing vegan festivals because I'm vegan. Uh, And that's eight hours on a stage. Wow, yeah. Once I found out I could do that, I started doing them all across the country for free. All I need is travel and vegan food. Yeah. And they're like, you're doing this for free? I'm like, yeah. Everyone thought I was stupid. I'm like, I don't care about the money. I'm, I'm not rich. I'm getting by, but I care about getting better. People ask me, how do you become a better speaker? Get better. Yeah. Be undeniable. And hours on stage will make me undeniable. So I'm, I'm, I'm emceeing two-day veg fest every other weekend. I'm on stage for 16 hours. I'm, I'm counting up minutes in my head. Then I realized, okay, I can double down. I can milk this for more. I started reaching out to the veg fest. I'm like, okay, I want to do a comedy show the day before. You guys promote it, and I donate all the charity, all the money to the local animal charity. So more stage time. Started speaking at schools. T- started talking about bullying. I would take over a gym class. I call them GTOs, gym class takeovers, gym takeovers. And I would take over the gym class for an entire week and do the same, bo- same speech seven times a day. I want stage time. I want to get better. Right. Everyone thought it was silly. I'm going around speaking all around Kansas City, trying to get better in between my fighting. I'm doing comedy. I'm speaking. I'm, I'm seeing. Uh, and I'm still training for the Olympics. I'm winning. I'm traveling all around the world. Uh, 2016, and all this is being documented uh, for like a, a Netflix documentary. Yeah, dope. That's so, crazy. Yeah. What it, was that? What was that? What was that called? Counterpunch. Counterpunch. It's, it's still out on Netflix right now. Uh, and again, I didn't get paid for the Netflix thing. Everyone thought I was stupid for that. But I was like, okay, I'm a because as athletes, you got to leverage things. So right. I'm like, okay. This will be a little invasive. This will be two years of my life, but that's a calling card that's going to give me credibility for the rest of my life. Right. I didn't go to college. I don't got a degree. My championships are my degree. The fact that I got a Netflix uh, documentary, that's, that gives me credibility. No I'm question. just use, I'm leveraging things. As athletes, we got to leverage what we can. No question. Uh, and athlete privilege. You get in doors that normal people don't get in. Yeah. I'm in rooms I shouldn't be in. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, yeah. Look again. I, I can't say I have a Netflix documentary, right? I know, I know. Just putting that out there in the air gets you in rooms. But as an athlete, you've gotten things you don't oh, d- yeah. necessarily deserve. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And we, you deserve them because <laughs> you're mean, really you're good the at man. Yeah, absolutely. You're not always the man, though. The things that you used to get, you get them now. No, I ain't never paid for a gym membership in my whole career. Yeah. When I got retired, there was like uh, sixty dollars a month. I was like, what? <laughs> But as an athlete, you, you don't have that forever, so you have to utilize that. So that was my plan. I'm going up to the 2016 Olympics. My goal is go to the Olympics, whether I get a medal or not, use that to, to get into to performing and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and then I got in, I, during the time I got really into doing the speeches at schools, 
And to do comedy, you have to go to open mic nights. And I didn't want to go to open mic nights. So I would just spend the last five, ten minutes of each session with students doing clean comedy. Yeah. And they liked that better than the speech. Oh, no. So I just started doing um, our comedy shows at schools. All the jokes have morals and messages around it. So I'm getting to perform. I'm, make, I'm making a difference. I'm talking about bullying, the thing that got me into involved in boxing in the first place. Yeah. And I still get to do what I love. That's awesome. So 2016, I win the Olympic trials, finally. And then I lose an international competition and don't get a spot in Rio. How'd you feel about that? I knew I had enough tools in my belt to survive. I was like, all right, so I, I can't, um, as soon as I got out the ring, I made a, put a tweet out. Lost my fight today. My Olympic run is over. Time to re-re-reinvent myself because this is the third time I ain't go to the Olympics. I'm, I remember putting re, re, re. This is my third time. <laughs> so, and I put, it may not be boxing. I didn't want to put, I'm going into speaking because people are like, no, 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 turn pro. But I put, it may not be boxing because I just wanted like, I'm, this was, this is my plan when I first started boxing was I was trying to be a performer. Yeah. So I, 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 I was like, okay, I want to go into speaking. That's more of a stable career. I've, I have enough ex, uh, experience speaking at all these schools that I've been trying to get, get better on stage. I got the stand up behind me. So I came back to Kansas City. I'm trying to build my speaking business. Couldn't get booked in any of these schools. Wow. Well, what, what was a roadblock? What, what do you feel like? If you, gotta, if you want to be an expert, you got to leave town. Because they saw young me going into all these schools speaking as a kid. And now, now I got my stuff together. They still see me as that person I used to be. Gotcha. I was mad at them. I was mad at them. And I realized, oh, no, it's not them. This is the whole victim thing. It's very easy. Here's why it's so easy to be a victim. Because that feeling you get from accomplishing something, mm. you get that same feeling from being a victim. Mm. And the latter is a lot easier. Mm. Really? Oh, because you can just, oh, pity, pity me. And you get that same, oh, oh, That attention, oh. that, that yeah. Or you can win something like, oh, 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 it's the same us. Gosh. Gotcha. Which one's wow. easier? Yeah. So I was like, okay, this is not my fault. This, this is not their fault. This is on me. I got to get undeniably good. Mm-hmm. So a year later, I bought a van and I lived in my van for the next three years speaking around the country. If you ain't going to book me in Kansas City, I ain't going to stop. Mm. So I lived, I lived in my van, and it wasn't, like, romantic, like, oh, <laughs> I was broke. Like, I wasn't posting I was broke, but, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was making it happen. Hey, doing like, the number two. I didn't, I didn't have AC in the van in the first, in the first few months. It was, wow. it was rough. I started in July in, in Arizona. Wow. 100 degrees at night. You the man, dog. Wow. But I think it's, you just got to keep doing it. Right. One plus two equals three. Your feelings don't matter. Oh, I'm not comfortable. I'm unhappy. Mm, no. Yeah. Don't nobody because who you can complain to? Yeah. And now you're booking gigs all across the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Man. Hey, last year I spoke in Portugal. <laughs> hey, and I, I just can't imagine. Like when you look back at the road that you, you took and, and all the work that you put in, the, the free sessions, the free speaking, the free comedy gigs, right? The, the veg fest, all of that, like. Are you are you tremendously proud of yourself? Like, do you feel like you still got such a long way to go, or like, where, how do you how do you stand with yourself now? Oh, this is just the first part of the plan. Yeah, this is this is part of a, a, a much larger plan of financial security and freedom. Yeah. Uh, so in my head, the reason why I wanted to get like into first, I wanted to be on TV because I was like, I just I want to be rich. And when I was a kid, it's not I thought I wanted to be rich, but I just wanted stability. And as a kid, I hated being in timeout because I didn't get to do what I wanted with my time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the way to put it. That's, and, and now as an adult, most adults, they struggle with that same very thing, right? Every morning you wake right. up, you do something you don't want to do. Trading time for money. So I was like, okay, I will do anything I have to. I will live in a van if I have to. If that means I get to do what I want to do. Mm. I'm willing to do everything I don't want to do to get the things I don't have. That's crazy, bro. That's crazy. And you got a grand plan, huh? We just we got to wait to watch. You know, uh, tell us about it. So the, the plan was like, so right now I want to, so motivational humor, not yet a genre. Hard to market because you can't tell schools you do something that doesn't exist. Right. I don't like the term motivational speaker. It's cheesy. It's gimmicky. 
motivations for suckers. <laughs> like, here's, I, I thought I liked working out. I retired, and I, it's hard. I'm working out with you now. Yeah. Because it's hard for me to get in the gym. Here's, my girl asked me, she was like, do you like working out? And I was like, I never thought about it. I, I legit, I thought I was a super motivated, like, person. I was never motivated. I was disciplined. Right. I knew I had to do it. Now I don't have to do it. There's no reason for me to do it. Now I'm like, okay, career-wise, like, I'm a speaker. I got to look presentable on stage. It's, physique is a part of it. So, like, all right, now I got to get in shape. So, now I'm in here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I got lost in where we're going with this, but... Uh, as of, as of right now, the plan is to continue to build myself up as a motivational humorist, or if that's that's the term. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, start to purchase property. That's what's up. Uh, property is the next venture, and uh, doing more stand up. Yeah. Do more stand up, and uh, yeah, I, I'm back on tour in August. I, I take take off on August fourth. That's and awesome, man. B- back on the road, out of the van now. Yeah. <laughs> I moved on up, man. I moved on up, but like. You got to go through the sucky part and people like see me. I get to travel. I'm flying and I'm flying Southwest. I ain't balling, but I get a one. I'm like Southwest first class. <laughs> yeah. No emergency room for me. Like I'm living good, bro. A one status. A one since day one. But speakers, athletes reach out. They want to do this. And I'm like, oh, how do you, how do you get booked and busy? Get good. Right. Are Put you good? Work. You think you're good, but do that speech a thousand more times. Which one do you rather get paid for? Which one do you think you deserve to get paid for? That's it. Like, you're not good enough. That's it. That's a weird thing to say to someone, right? You're not good enough. Michael Jordan didn't make his basketball team in middle school. Do you know why? He wasn't good enough. Man. He wasn't good enough. What if his dad would have showed up and be like, ah, you better let my son, on, at least on the bench, let him on the team. Probably wouldn't work this hard, right? Wouldn't have grinded. Wouldn't have put in that, that, wouldn't have done that shitty stuff to get where he got. You ain't good enough. Yeah. You can tell yourself that. I can tell myself I'm awesome. Also, I can tell myself I'm not good enough. Yeah. And that's what makes me awesome. No. And, and man, I, I agree 100% with what you said um, throughout this, this podcast and show. But that motivation piece, I, I, I stand by it 100% as well, right? Motivation, is, it's a gimmick. It comes and it goes, right? And I tell people that all the time, my clients that all the time, right? Because I can tell when they're motivated, when they just had, you know, maybe they, they feeling good. They lady said, oh, baby, you, you've been working out. I can tell. Like, good. They come back to the gym the next day in that funk. And then the next, very next week, no, no words from the lady. Maybe the lady gives somebody, they see The Rock on TV, and it's like, ooh, The Rock. And he's like, what shit, the, what about me? Yeah. Like, what you mean, The Rock? Like, you know what I mean? You could have a shitty day at work. It could be a terrible time, and your motivation goes, it shifts the other way. But that don't mean you don't come in the gym. That don't mean you don't put in the work. Like, consistency and dedication is going to get you to where you got to be. And, I, you know, it, again, we were blessed to be able to learn that early in life that, hey, if I just put in this work, it'll, it'll change the outcome. It'll make me a different person. And I believe, again, with your whole name change and the shift, your mentality, I tell people that all the time, too. You can be whoever you want to. You have to believe it co-heartedly. Like, you have to, like, if you believe it long enough and hard enough, the next person will, too. Your friends will. Your mom will. You, like, mm-hmm. hey, my name is this now. Call me this. Don't, I'm not going by that person. I didn't like that person. That person didn't get me what I wanted in life. This is who I am now, and this is what I do. But you got to believe that, right? You got to carry yourself as that. And the same thing goes with just kind of like you want to be a boss. You want to be an owner of a gym or whatever it is you want to do in life. You have to start carrying yourself as though you already are that person, right? Yeah. You, you can't be the guy who wakes up at noon, gets off the couch and, <laughs> you know, eats a bag of Cheetos and, you know, scrolls through the ads. Like, you got to be the guy who gets up at five o'clock in the morning and go gets it. You know what I mean? Here's why I think those people, those like the people that you're describing that like that wakes up at noon. Yeah. Those are the same people that push back on me when I mention humble. Because right. when I, I mention the humble thing, it's always like, humble's not thinking less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. Or some cute saying they always have. I'm like, but look at the definition and words are powerful. And it's the people who don't believe in themselves who are most likely to push back on the idea of being humble. And the whole idea of like putting a ceiling on yourself. Because if, uh, if, if, if you constantly tell, whether you think you can or you think you can't, Right. You're right. You are 
Right. Why would you ever <laughs> think you couldn't? No, that's it. No, that's absolutely right. And like I said, it, I think it's what held me back for so long. It wasn't until I really started getting into kind of like the, the self-help books and podcasts and the entrepreneurship podcasts and things like that, where I heard people kind of talking about really like speaking highly of yourself and believing in yourself and just like shifting your mindset that helped me believe that I can do whatever I want to. Right. Yeah. Like I own a gym. I've never owned a gym before. Yeah. Nobody showed me how to do it. I, you know, to be honest, I went to school, but to be honest, I've learned more on my own watching podcasts and taking one-off classes and courses that I ever learned in school about running a gym or being my own boss. Right. So it was just still that doubt, that self doubt that, that, can I do this? Like, am I really, can I really be a boss? Can I really operate and run a team? Can I make this happen? And I just had to like flip that switch and be like, bro, you can do this. Like, Was it easy at first? No, not at all. Sucked? Absolutely. Absolutely. That first year was, woohoo. Oh my goodness. I had business partners too. Thank God I don't have, uh, woo. Yeah, that's a whole nother story. We won't. But, but then, but you, you figured it out, right? Figured it out. Absolutely. It's, it's going through that initial part. You, you mentioned something earlier about uh, changing your thought process. Yeah. Here's something that I figured out during the pandemic. So uh, we read, we read someone's, we'll go out to Barnes and Noble, we'll buy books. So I got a library card, by the way. It's a flex. Like, they giving out free books, bro. <laughs> There's no late fees. Just return it whenever you get a chance, bro. They got apps, you get audio books, straight, it's free. But I still go to Barnes & Noble because their book display is better. So you, you, that's a gem. You go to Barnes & Noble, you see which books you should buy, and then you get it from the library on the app <laughs> while you on Barnes & Noble Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> so we buy, we go through all this process. We go to Barnes & Noble, we use connected Wi-Fi, we go to the library, we get, we get a book that we're going to return on time, and we get to the end of the first chapter, and it says, hey, Jesse, you made it to the end of the first chapter. Do this action step. Mm. What do you do, Jesse? Keep reading. You keep reading. We all keep reading. <laughs> I got books. I got shelves of books I never went back to. Yeah. And I'm like, all the secrets to the universe are in books. No one does number two. No one's doing any of the work. So I said, the next book I read, I'm doing everything. Everything yeah. in this book. Yeah. It was Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Uh, a little woo-woo for me. But, you know, your boy had post-it notes. I'm doing mantras in the shower. I'm, I'm thinking about things like I'm vision board. I'm balls deep. Right. It started working. Nice. Started working. I was like, okay, if this works with money. Can it work with happiness? Uh, so uh, notes to self. Uh, it's this lady. I probably shouldn't be showing my socks up <laughs> on here. But she puts positive affirmations on socks. Yeah. Uh, I ran into her and I asked her why. And she says, she has a company called Notes to Self. And she's here in Kansas City. Uh, she says, your brain is most receptive to information, neither positive nor negative, just information first thing in the morning. Mm. So you read a positive affirmation as you're putting on your socks. I'm crushing it today. You say, I'm crushing it today. I'm crushing it today. And you, you, that's little affirmations. I go hard. You saw me with stage time. You saw me with fighting. Right. I was like, well, I'm not just going to do one affirmation. So every morning before I looked at my phone, because we see negative things on our phone all the time. Every time I get on Twitter, hashtag RIP, somebody I grew up loving. People die every day nowadays. Right. Oh, they always have died in our every day. It's just now we notice it because we got our phones. So before I check my phone, I write a list of 10 things I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for my house. I'm grateful for my car. I'm grateful for my washer. I'm grateful for my dryer. Those are two different things. You can be grateful for everything. And if you never had to go to laundromat, you don't know what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> bro, growing up, I was like, I can't wait to get a washer and dryer. Yeah, no. Another thing, uh, that click, you know, you, the click when you put your gas tank and you, it flexes when you can just, you know, do the automatic and, and walk it. away. Yeah. Walk away because you're not doing math when you <laughs> pump your gas. Hey, that's you, big, right? That's big. You, you can't let your, your account get less than $20 because then you can't take anything out the ATM. Like the struggle. So when I put, I'm grateful, I'm grateful I can fill my gas tank. That was one of the things on my list the first day. I just, I th and I don't mean to cut you, but yes, no, I remember the village when I started to be able to pump gas and or have somebody when everybody was talking about the economy and how gas prices are and this and that and me not to even know what the price was. I was flex like, King, yo, flex. yo, I, I'm doing something. <laughs> <laughs> I felt good. But go ahead, man. Yeah. Uh, so like, I, I decided that I was going to do this for 30 days uh, and 30 days, but I wasn't going to repeat anything on this list. Yeah. So by like day 10, 
started getting difficult. I was like, ah, I was real cocky in the beginning. Now I'm like, it's like 20 minutes in, I'm looking for things around my house. And I, I really want to look at my phone. So what I started doing is I would look for things to be grateful for throughout my day, store in my memory, call it delayed gratification, write in my list first thing in the morning. Mm. That way I could look at my phone faster. Side note, went down a TikTok rabbit hole, found out about your RAS, your reticular activating system. Uh, so, your brain, so your brain takes in a bunch of information, a b- bunch of bits of information every moment, not every second, every moment, 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 moment. A lot of moments, a lot of information. Your brain can't process all of that. It's not pertinent to you. So your RAS acts as a filter. If you ever heard what you seek is what you will find, that's what you're talking about. So if you ever went car shopping for a yellow, well, you, go car shopping, right? Right, right. You decide, all right, I'm going for a yellow car. Yeah. And you don't get the yellow car, but after that, you start seeing yellow cars everywhere. Everywhere. If that has ever happened to you, it you just got, happened to me yesterday. <laughs> I, I just bet you think you're unique in your car, right? <laughs> Thank you. I just I seen the exact same color. I like I've never seen one of these in Kansas City. And here we go. I've seen the same car. You've seen that car so many times. But the thing is, it's never been pertinent to your brain. It's never right. been relevant to you. Yeah. Isn't it funny that your car happens to be the most popular car you see on the road? All the time now. It's because that's the RES. So what your RES says, all those cars are there, but it's not relevant to you. And the second you say, hey. Jesse, we're looking for a yellow car. Your brain's like, Jesse, yellow car, yellow car, yellow car. Your kid's TV show, yellow car. Kid's toys, yellow car. Like, you start seeing yellow cars everywhere. And you're like, where are these yellow cars? They've always been there. There's so many things in this universe. Your brain can only process so many things, and your brain tells you stories. And you make sense of these stories. Wow. What you seek is what you will find. Mm. What you're looking for. Wow. Social media. Yeah, it's so negative too. You're right, man. That's that. Wow, that's a gem, bro. I appreciate that. That's that is. I hear dropping them, son. <laughs> I hear dropping them. No, nah, man, that is awesome, yo. Uh yeah, because that's so true. Again, just yesterday, I, I swear, just got a new car. Purple. Congrats, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate Congrats, it. Congrats, by the way. Just you earned it. One of those things, like the gas price. It's like all right. Okay, leveling up. I appreciate it. Nah, man. But that's, that's again, thank you for sharing that, bro. So, again, I, I want to say, again, how proud I am of you, man. Just, thank again, you, call you a friend and be able to see your, your growth um, from, again, the boxing world, the Netflix special, from you grinding it out, speaking, and now you, you know, again, speaking around the world, doing your thing. So I really look forward to seeing what you do in the next, you know, five, ten years with comedy and speaking. I know it's going to be big, and just I hope you, you know, bring me along with you. You know oh, what I mean? Man, bring uh, me along. I'm, I heard I'm, you speaking I'm, now too. Hey, I'm, I'm trying, dog, with, with with the guidance of you. I appreciate it, man. But um, no. So before we wrap this up, if we could do a couple of things, one, I love for you to drop a gem for us again on if you had to go back and talk to the young Cam, right? If you could tell them one thing that you learned that would probably help speed up the process. And it might be, you know, what you've already told us here, but if it's one thing that you would really kind of focus in to, to make gains faster, right, to, to take over the boxing world faster or the speaking world faster, like what, what would you have told the younger you? Tradition stunts growth. Uh, tradition stunts growth. Don't do anything because other people are doing it. Always ask why and always ask authority why. And when authority can't tell you why, they shouldn't be authority. You are now authority. Mm. Uh, one of the things in the boxing ring like in the boxing gym the speed bag waste of time it's just a loud piece of equipment in the gym but people love hitting it it's fun but it's, there's no actual purpose to it so I don't hit it but I don't like it because it makes noise and I like to listen to the music in the gym so I don't like when people hit it so if you're hitting it I'm like hey why are you hitting that and you're like hand dark coordination I'll say no it's not and you're like yes it is I'm like are you good at this and you're like yeah, I'm the best and then you, I'm like hit it with your eyes closed and you're like Ugh. If you can hit it with your eyes closed, how is that hand-eye coordination? <laughs> At best, hand-air coordination. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. But people do that because they've seen other people do it, and they've seen champion boxers do it, and they're like, the only way I can be a champion is if I do that. But no one stopped to ask why. Average boxer works out about 300 times a year. Mm-hmm. Let's say he hits the speed bag for three rounds, right? That's three rounds, three three-minute ones, one minute in between – That ends up to be, I worked it out, it's 80 hours a year. 80 hours a year, you hit the speed bag Mm. as a boxer. If you had an extra 80 hours a year, wouldn't it be better to work on a jab? Defense? Wow. Counterpunching? Wow, yeah. 
I look at everything in metrics. And if you look at things in metrics, you realize a lot of authority are only in authority because they did what the authority before them said. I had beef with the Army boxing coach back in the day. Yeah. Because he would try to get me to wake up at 6 a.m. to go running. People wake up at 6 a.m. to go running before they go to work. This is my work. <laughs> Don't knock on my door till 10, bro. <laughs> he's like, you need to be disciplined. Like, if you had discipline, I said, no, no, no. It's not discipline. It's different. It's different. You're doing tradition. That's, you're disciplined to tradition. I'm not disciplined to tradition. Because... I've won more national championships than the entire army. There's 11 people on the army team. I've won more nationals than all 11 over the course of 100 years. Wow. So don't tell me about tradition, bro. That's wild, dog. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great, man. That's great. And then if you could put you on the spot here, you got two books, podcasts, YouTube. What have you been listening to or reading lately that might, again, help level, level up somebody's game? Uh... I, uh, so what I've been, uh, what am I currently reading? Uh, I'm reading a book on shrooms right now. Uh, mushroom and the sacred and the sacred cross. Really? Uh, just about how psychedelics was actually in, introduced through Christianity and the rituals. And it was just more of a fertility thing, but I'm in the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, but I'm like, that, that's, that's, that's pretty cool to me. Uh, and uh, reading, uh, yeah, if it's, a, it could be a podcast or yeah. YouTube, anything. I'm, uh, I'm reading a second book I'm reading is a, a Joe Dispenza book. Also just started that one. Yeah. Uh, I just got a, got a new library card at Johnson County library and yeah, they go hard <laughs> out you there, go, bro. You going wild with the car. They you, got video you, games out there too. Oh man, man, I'm, I'm swiping all, the car hard. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I would, I would say that in a, I'm now, right now, if I'm being honest, I have been so, like, work-oriented and I'm, like, so in the zone that it's, like, it's hard for me to do comedy or anything because I'm in a box. I don't watch the news. I don't know what's going on in the world. There's nothing I know that's relevant. Yeah. So I'm, like, now I'm trying to break out the box. I'm trying to, like, watch things that people watch. I'm trying to, like, be a person. I realize being a person sucks. Like, yeah. most things are depressing. Every, everything's sad. God. So, yeah. like, I stay in my little bubble. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I hear you on that. It is like you said, social media in the world is 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 very negative. So I get it. I get I'm it. I'm sensitive. <laughs> hey, well, if you could before you leave, man, please do us a favor and tell us where we can find you. Tell us where I know you've been working on a few things. You about to yeah. launch a book here as yeah. well, right? Uh, I actually never spoke about that out loud before. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, becoming awesome. Uh, this book will be coming out hopefully in a month or two. Working on it now. Uh, just kind of speaking about some of my philosophies and and. Uh, ways to stop hearing about your feelings, fail, and just keep going. Gotcha. Yeah. That's dope. dope. Where can they find you? Handles? Uh, you, you can find me at KMF Awesome Erware. So uh, in KMFAwesome.com, uh, I speak at high schools, middle schools, colleges, and I also do corporate work as well. Uh, I was captain of the USA National Boxing Team for over 10 years. I traveled to over 30 countries representing the U.S. And as captain, I would have to find the do's and don'ts about each country. Then I would relay the message to my teammates so we don't look, make ourselves look like idiots off our soil. <laughs> uh, and doing that over the course of 10 years, I learned a lot about culture mm-hmm. and cultural communication. So I speak about cultural communication in the workplace as well. Man, that's awesome, bro. Hey, well, again, man, I thank you, Cam, for being on the show, dog. I look forward to, again to seeing what you do over the next five or 10 years, man. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it, dog. Number one. <laughs> Let's go, baby.